members and participants, we are now live. Good morning, everyone. I understand that state law currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. City Council committees are currently meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings of council committees are included in the public hearing notices that are published in the Daily News, Inquirer, and Legal Intelligence are prior to the hearings and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. I now note that the hour has come. Mr. McMonagall, will you please call the roll to take attendance? Members that are in attendance will please indicate that you are present when your name is called. Also, please say a few brief words when responding so that your image will be displayed on screen when you speak. Council Member Dom. Present, thank you. Council Member Brooks. Present. Council Member Gaultier. Good morning, Mr. Chair and colleagues and the public present. Council Member Gilmore Richardson. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, colleagues. I'm present. Council Member Green. Council Member Johnson. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Council Member Jones. Council Member O. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, colleagues. I'm present. Morning. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We do have a quorum of council members. Thank you. A quorum of the committee is present and this hearing is now called to order. This is the public hearing of the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development regarding resolution number 210643 and bill numbers 210632 and 210671. Mr. McMonagall, will you please read the titles of the bills and resolution that will be heard today? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Resolution number 210643, authorizing the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development to hold hearings on the economic impact of the film industry in Philadelphia. And bill number 210632, amending chapter 17-1600 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Economic Opportunity Plans by establishing new definitions and clarifying the manner in which credit is given for MWDSBE participation, all under certain terms and conditions. And bill number 210671, amending Title IX of the Philadelphia Code entitled Regulation of Businesses, Trades and Professions by adding a new chapter requiring certain businesses and professions to provide disclosures regarding tangled titles all under certain terms and conditions. Thank you. I see Chairman Squilla has arrived, so I'm going to turn the meeting back to the chairman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Vice Chair and uh, Chairman. Also, I appreciate you uh, being able to pop in there. Um, before we begin uh, our testimony from the witnesses uh, we have for today, everyone who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that this is a public hearing and is being recorded. Because uh, of the hearing being public, participants and viewers have no reason to be able to expect uh, pro uh, uh, participants and viewers uh, for their privacy. By continuing to be in the meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Additionally, prior to recognizing the members for the questions or comments uh, they have for the witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that there will be the chat feature available at Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized in order to comply with the Sunshine Act. And the chat feature must only be used for this purpose. Mr. McMonagall, will you please call the first panel for the witnesses we have to testify this morning? Mr. Chair? Yes. Hey, hey. Catherine, how are you? Good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, I wanted to offer very brief remarks before we get started with uh, Resolution 210643. Okay. Uh, you had a council member, you want to proceed? 
Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Well, good morning and thank all of you so much for being here today for this very important conversation. Uh, since I joined Philadelphia City Council as a member, I have been a strong advocate for the arts in our city. We know that art has, has an immense impact in Philadelphia. It brings joy to our communities. It is an outlet to address trauma. It is a mechanism for learning. It is a career. It is a tourism draw. It is a source of tax revenue. One of the most influential forms of art in our city is the film and television industry. As we all know, Philadelphia has earned a national reputation as a city that promotes the arts, yet we are maybe the only city in the world that does not provide funding to our film office. After years and years of cuts to their budget, the Greater Philadelphia Film Office was fully eliminated from the city budget in 2020 and again received no funding this year. As you will hear today, this lack of funding may have seemed like an easy way to trim a little money, $150,000, from our city's spending, but its impact has been huge. Our film office and our film commission is struggling to stay afloat, and without it, we will most definitely lose not only a significant source of tax revenue, uh, business income, and jobs, but we will also lose an institution that has helped an industry grow and thrive while also working to support and grow local talent here in our city. I call for this hearing because I felt there was no better way to make the case that we need to reinstate support for the Greater Philadelphia Film Office and we need to have this hearing to hear directly from those uh, who work in the film office and in this industry to ensure that we understand uh, the benefits of their hard work. I'm so grateful to Sharon Pinkinson for her ongoing commitment and years of dedication to the city of Philadelphia's film industry. Thank you for your work and the work of your entire team. And thank you to all the panelists who have joined us here today. And thank you to my colleagues for your time. I'm looking forward to this conversation, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, council member. And um, also just wanna add um, what a great advocate uh, the film office has been and the, the growth of the economy, um, but also their ability to communicate with uh, our offices when there are events in the city of Philadelphia. I think it's very important that they reach out to the neighborhood groups and also uh, flyer the neighborhood to know what is coming ahead of time. They've been uh, doing a great job and it has really helped to engage the community and make them part of this process. So I want to thank them for that. And uh, Mr. McMonagall, when you please read the, the uh, next panel to testify. Certainly. Good morning. Could we please have Dawn Somerville, Cassie, uh, and then followed up by Cassie Thompson and Greg DeShields. Good morning. Hopefully everybody is connected and uh, ready to proceed. Um, please state your name in that order um, for the record and proceed with your testimony. Dawn, I guess you could go first. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson. You want me to start with my name? I'm sorry, Councilman. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dawn Somerville, Deputy Commerce Director. Good morning, Chairperson Squilla and members of the Committee of Commerce and Economic Development. My name is Dawn Somerville, and I'm ha I am the Deputy Commerce Director of Business Development for the Commerce Department. I'm happy to be here today to provide testimony on resolution 210643, which authorizes a public hearing on the economic impact of the film industry in Philadelphia. I'd like to start by thanking this committee for highlighting the tremendous opportunity that Philadelphia holds for businesses in the film industry. Over the years, Philadelphia has produced several iconic films and gained international appraise for works such as Concrete Cowboy, trading places, and more. Philadelphia is home to more than 100 motion picture and video companies that demonstrate a significant impact on our economy. These companies make an estimated $124 million in sales and employ approximately 870 individuals. A typical movie on location spends dollars on local hotels, restaurants, gas stations, dry cleaners, hardware stores, and area labor. Most picture production generates state sales tax revenue on everything from the purchase of materials for set construction to equipment. Good morning, how are you? Doing good, how was your weekend? 
the equipment. Excuse me, somebody. Can you please? Um, somebody's unmuted. Oh, you got it, Josh. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry, Dawn. Please continue. Thank you. Motion Picture Productions generate state sales tax revenue on everything from the purchase of materials for set construction to equipment rentals, as well as local wage taxes on labor. The Commerce Department knows all too well of the importance of the creative economy in the city. Commerce applauds the work of the Greater Philadelphia Film Office for their commitment to the growth of the regional film and video production industry, as well as their support and extensive resources to our local filmmakers. Commerce remains dedicated to supporting all businesses throughout the city and in all sectors, and we especially look forward to continuing to work alongside the film industry to support its continued growth. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. I'd like to wait for questions until the first panel is completed testifying. Um, Mr. Mamani, we're going to read the next person to testify. Can we please have Cassie Tompkins? Good morning. Thank you so much. Chairman Squilla, Vice Chairman Dom, and members of the committee, thank you for having me here today. My name is Cassie Tompkins, and I'm the Deputy Chief of Staff at Visit Philadelphia, the official regional marketing agency of the Philadelphia Five County Region. I'm honored to speak today in support of one, our, one of our industry partners, the Greater Philadelphia Film Office, and their work to promote the city of Philadelphia through the film industry. As you may know, Visit Philadelphia's mission is to build Greater Philadelphia's image, drive visitation, and boost the economy, all goals shared by the Greater Philadelphia Film Office and strengthened by the film industry. The Film Office's mission to bring filmmakers to Philadelphia and grow the industry across the region is essential to driving visitation from both industry professionals as well as tourists. It also builds the brand of Philadelphia through the power of film. When the city is a backdrop of a commercial or plays a starring role in productions, Philadelphia's brand gets stronger and reaches wider audiences. Just this weekend, the Wall Street Journal um, had a feature and it mentioned uh, Always Sunny in Philadelphia, you know, those really cultural pieces that build our city's um, notoriety. We also know that film drives visitation. All we have to do is look at the line for photos with the Rocky statue for proof. And when visitors come, they spend money in our restaurants, shops, and hotels. In 2019, the regional economic impact of visitor spending was $12.3 billion. And also those dollars stay in Philadelphia. For every dollar in funding for the Greater Philadelphia Film Office, $638 were spent directly in the city. Um, the film industry also plays a vital role in the economic health. Since 1992, Greater Philadelphia Film Office has generated $6 billion in economic impact in Philadelphia. The Greater Philadelphia Film Office is essential to Philadelphia's status as a world-class city by contributing to the positive image of Philadelphia and generating economic impact for the city. Collaboration is the key to recovery and funding for the Greater Philadelphia Film Office benefits residents, small businesses, and organizations beyond the sector by promoting the city of Philadelphia on a global stage. Thank you for your time and for your support of the Greater Philadelphia Film Office and our hospitality and tourism industry partner. Thank you. Thank you. Cassie, thank you for your testimony. Uh, before we go to questions, um, I'd like to go to Greg. Uh, to state your name for your, the record, Greg, and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Sure. Good morning, Philadelphia City Council. My name is Greg DeShields. I'm the Executive Director of PHL Diversity, a Business Development Division of the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau. The Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau creates a positive impact across the Philadelphia region, driving jobs and promoting the health and vibrancy of our hospitality industry by marketing the destination, the Pennsylvania Convention Center, and attracting overnight visitors. Our work engages our local community and culturally and ethnically diverse region, national and international conventions that come to the city of Philadelphia. We are an economic engine for the city of Philadelphia and along with our other partners help to create jobs that really fuel the economy 
which is very much aligned with the work that they do at the Greater Philadelphia Film Office. We advocate on Philadelphia for Philadelphia throughout the region, as well as providing a resource in terms of generating uh, economic activity around tourism and hospitality. As well, the PHL Diversity Business Development Division provides innovative and creative customer service resources that really reach those diverse and multicultural groups. Our efforts are to ensure that we promote Philadelphia as a top destination for diverse and multicultural meetings and conventions. Successful events rely on unique destinations. The benefits of remarkable spaces go just beyond any particular event. They also include the travel experience and the interaction with the local community and its culture. As a destination marketing organization, we are not just promoting the location. We also market the unique location industry, focusing on local expertise as well as business opportunities. And the impact of the film industry has been significant, contributing to economic vibrancy of our local film, our local businesses. The Greater Philadelphia Film Office creates our local film and video industry in every way possible, recognizing its substantial economic impact on jobs creation and the unparalleled public relations effect that they bring to the region. The film office work is critical to building the city's brand and the perception of Philadelphia's hospitality community. Additionally, there is a clear economic benefit whether it's crew, staff, talent, and associated stakeholders, they consume hotel rooms, meeting space, dining selection, transportation, and various amenities that are provided for local businesses. From the perspective of PHL diversity, before the devastation of the COVID-19 impact, many of our multicultural customers were excited by the release of the film Concrete Cowboy, featuring the uh, Idris Bola, who was the um, talent who was the lead actor, as well as the screenplay, which was by a native Philadelphian, Ricky Staub. And I should point out, by the way, his father, Rick Staub, served as a vice president here at the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau, as well as the managing director of the Lowe's Philadelphia Hotel. You know, film has really helped to um, tell the authentic story of Philadelphia. And for us, that is a big win in terms of how we are able to distinguish Philadelphia from other cities. You know, my closing thought would be that authenticity is essential for promoting a destination. Storytelling, or what we say is authentic travel, is what travelers of all ages seek when they are engaged in a local destination. And to that degree, the films that are told about Philadelphia create an environment that really inspire and encourage people to continue to visit and be a part of our community. So I trust that my comments have really shared the perspective of how, in fact, important the film office is to us at the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau. Thank you very much. Greg, thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, before we go to questions, I'd like to recognize Council Member Jones, who is present for the committee. Um, Council Member Nao. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I do, I do have questions. Uh, let me direct it to any of the panelists, but particularly um, to uh, Deputy Commerce Director Don Somerville. Um, first, let me uh, thank uh, uh, Council Member um, uh, Catherine Gilmore Richardson for this important hearing. Uh, we have we have had hearings on the importance of filmmaking, so it should not be a surprise to the administration or to council. Um, and uh, I, I just uh, want to understand if it is possible, and I don't want to seem like I'm picking on anybody because I don't know if you can answer these questions, but what is the disconnect between the information that we're talking about and um, the administration? Because it sounds very good, but in fact, the ad administration uh, cut the budget of the film office in 2020 by $133,000, and then again in 2021. Um, and I introduced a bill to restore the money that was cut, $133,000 uh, 133, in 2020, uh, and that did not pass. Um, I did a bill again in 2021 to restore $250,000 in, in, in money that was cut um, from the film office. And the film office has been cut, but we, we do understand the importance 
of filmmaking uh, to many sectors, as was pointed out. And by the way, we got $1.4 billion from the federal government to stimulate the economy. And that money was not given to the film office or, or, or other creative arts entities. Can, is there some explanation? Are we talking out of both sides of our mouth or is this a commitment from the administration right now to fund the film office? Good morning, and thank you for that question, Councilman O. As you know, there were several cuts that uh, the Department of Commerce had to make over the duration of the pandemic, um, which still we are not clear from, correct? Um, and that money was diverted to some of our smaller um, businesses, our BIPOC communities to help support them to move forward. Those were some hard decisions we had to make, um, but that's the direction we had to go. What I'm hoping for, honestly, um, is that not only for local, but the state um, investment into film offices, whether, and we've discussed this before through some of your um, resolutions that you've put through about tax credits. Um, honestly, Philadelphia compared to some of the other states that are making significant um, investments, we lag. We lag behind um, with Georgia that doesn't have a cap. We're lagging behind in Delaware. We lag behind in New Jersey. Um, and this is a discussion I would like to continue um, to have. I can't, again, make a decision of what the administration is going to do, but I can tell you that we can go back and have this discussion with the Commerce Director and continue to move forward. I appreciate your answer. I want everyone to know that you are you are really uh, standing up for the uh, department and the administration. I appreciate your your doing that. Um, I would finally like to say that I did introduce a tax incentive bill, bill number two one zero seven eight four, which creates a um, twenty five percent local tax incentive for um, production in Philadelphia that spends five hundred thousand dollars. If they meet the minority hiring requirement, they only need $250,000 for a 25% uh, tax credit. Um, have you had or anyone in the department an opportunity to re review that um, film tax credit, film tax incentive uh, bill? Enough to make comment. We have reviewed it, um, but I can't make comment at this time. Again, Councilman O, I'll be happy to follow up with you um, for that discussion. I think there are some things that we saw. We do appreciate the minority participation piece that has to happen within that bill. Um, but again, we want to take a look between the city and the state um, regarding the funding around tax credits. OK, I, I will note that I have a bill with the state. I, I have introduced um, uh, legislation to my colleagues in Harrisburg that they are reviewing that bill to adopt a state bill um, around, you know, this topic. Uh, I hope it proceeds um, well, and I would hope that the administration would support, um, you know, the state funding um, arts recovery in Philadelphia. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council member. And also we have, um, it's a good uh, time here uh, for testimony. Uh, Sean, you want to read the next person here to testify? All right, it's, uh, All right, it's, it's Can we? No. Shannon, just state your name for the record and if connected, uh, please proceed with your testimony. I, I did see her earlier, Mr. Chair. All right. Hankinson, are you connected? Yes, I, I am. I'm, I'm very sorry. You were speaking on top of each other, and I didn't know whose names you were calling. I'm sorry. That was my <laughs> fault. I, uh, Thank you. Yes, just, just start, um, state your name for the record, and then um, proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, and again, uh, apologies about that. Um, I, my name is, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Sharon Pinkinson, and it is um, my great pleasure to be here today, and thank you for all the testimony so far. Uh, let me just 
see if I can find my testimony. That would be helpful. <laughs> Excuse me. No problem. Take your time. Um, we did have uh, previous three people testify. We had a question by Council Member O, and uh, we will continue uh, with the testimony. We want to thank you and your team for always being available. And uh, like I stated earlier, um, the appreciation for your outreach and, and connectivity to the community and our offices as um, you know, as these projects are, are moving forward and looking forward to many more of them. So uh, whenever you're ready, just again, just state your name again and then proceed. Thank you. Um, yes, and thank you, Chairman Squilla. Um, my name is Sharon Pinkinson. Thank you, Vice Chair Dom and members of the Commerce and Economic Development Committee. Thank you, especially to Councilwoman Gilmore Richardson for introducing this resolution. <clears throat> It has been my honor to serve as the executive director of the Greater Philadelphia Film Office for nearly 30 years, and the privilege and great honor to address all of the esteemed members of City Council. I am particularly thankful to be able to speak along with several colleagues who will also testify to the work and the phenomenal economic impact and explosion of civic pride generated by hundreds of productions that have spent billions of dollars in Philadelphia, thanks to the tremendous success of the Greater Philadelphia Film Office. As executive director, I oversee GPFO's programs, beginning with attracting productions that shoot in Philadelphia, as well as coordinating all of the day-to-day -day activities for multiple productions at a time. We work closely with police, parks and rec, streets, health, risk management, public property, law, and the managing director's office. Major productions from LA and New York that produce their projects in Philadelphia drive many millions of dollars to the city. Even in the midst of the pandemic, film production has continued thanks to the strongest COVID-19 protocols established by the film industry in July of 2020. And in Philadelphia, with the guidance and support of our outstanding health department. Consequently, the industry's direct spend in the past fiscal year during COVID was $148 million with an estimated impact of $309 million. As you know, GPFO's annual grant from the city was eliminated with the July 2020 city budget. Shocked by this news, we furloughed one of our six staff members the one who was responsible for marketing and development, and the remaining five, including myself, took 50% pay cuts. Our mission was to keep fighting for our funding, which was fruitless, and we started a GoFundMe campaign, which attracted $46,000 out of the $200,000 we hoped for. We applied for every grant we could, and we continued to work. Despite our plea for funding in 2021, we received nothing. Our fear is and was that without a professional film commission in Philadelphia, filmmakers would no longer choose Philadelphia for their productions. GPFO is universally known as one of the best film commissions on the planet. We create jobs for locals and non-locals, literally thousands of jobs in feature films, television series, documentaries, television commercials, both local and national, as well as supporting student films. Each of these workers pays city Philadelphia taxes, whether they live in the city or not, so long as they are working or living here as it should be. The jobs vary from electricians to truck drivers, set builders, sign makers, hair and makeup artists, actors, caterers, grips, camera operators, costumers, post-production technicians, office workers, carpenters and painters, gardeners, writers, lighting directors and location scouts, directors and producers, just to name a few. They generate hundreds of millions of dollars in economic impact each year. Last fiscal year, 368 projects were produced in Philadelphia. Our two-person production team works with each project individually diligently addressing their needs and coordinating with countless city offices. 
and we interface with the citizens of Philadelphia and your staff to inform your constituents of street closures, parking, and more. Beyond production, we are a nonprofit that uniquely serves our industry through our Greater Philadelphia Filmmakers Program. Established in 2001, Filmmakers is a natural extension of our work. In addition to attracting production to the region for the purpose of economic development, GPFO is committed to nurturing the local industry in every way possible. Prior to the pandemic and loss of city funding, we held monthly workshops to educate new filmmakers and aspiring ones. We're even hosting one tomorrow, touching on the growing business in the horror film production. For young filmmakers, we partnered with the Fund for the School District of Philadelphia to create production-focused programming at Strawberry Mansion High School. Classes that provide instruction for exciting family-sustaining careers have already begun, similar to the successful music program at the school. More about that from Frank Machos, who runs the program for the fund. We also teach at Temple, Drexel, UArts, and we're advising more College of Art on their newly minted film curricula. Through our fiscal sponsorship program, we support socially focused film projects under our nonprofit umbrella, allowing them to access grants and fund their vital artistic work. We typically have about 30 clients at any given time. We expose upcoming screenwriters to major producers through our Set in Philadelphia screenwriting competition and offer hefty cash prizes for women and those from the African diaspora, along with a major grand prize for the best Set in Philadelphia screenplay of the year. We are committed to diversity in all areas, including our board of directors, our crew members, and our filmmakers. In conclusion, as a staff of five that manages a multi-billion dollar industry that drives tourism, business, and job growth year after year, our work deserves funding from the city we serve. While we pride ourselves as being set apart from other film office, film offices because of our dedicated production team and education focused programs. This lack of funding also sets us apart from our fellow film commissions. All film commissions worldwide rely on government support. We are counting on you, our esteemed council members, to restore our funding now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sharon. and. Um, I do want to ask you, you a question uh, before some of our members um, get on. But when you when you first go in for the budgetary process before they make the announcement in March, did they ask you for a reduced budget amount uh, as far as part of commerce's um, um, budget? Did they commerce say, all right, we need to reduce a budget? What can you work with or? Was that not part of the conversation? No, we were not asked. All right. So during that time, so then Commerce would make the decision, I guess, at that point, whether the funding, uh, and it was a total of what? Was it 150,000? What was the total amount? That um, would it was 100. The, the, it was reduced significantly in every year um, in this during this administration um, from uh, 163,952 down to the last two years, 19 and 20, to 130,944 before it was eliminated altogether. Okay, and when you had heard that this was a possibility, um, I know you had come to counsel other folks to try to get additional dollars put back into the budget and, and was not uh, successful. Um, when we work with uh, the administration, were you after that point, were you working with commerce or anybody within the administration to try to add additional dollars, maybe through a transfer ordinance or anything? Um, Chairman, I am I think I tried about everything that I that I possibly could. No um, there are so few of us now. There was a time when we were eight people in our office. The one person we had to let go was our marketing and development. A, a member, um, literally, we were we were just doing everything we could to keep the business going. 
We did get a PPP loan for the first term, the first round. <laughs> okay. Uh, what, what we do? We have a couple of questions here. I do want to recognize them before we go to questions. Councilmember Green is present uh, for the hearing, but I also I know uh, uh, our sponsor for this resolution, uh, Councilmember uh, Councilman Gilmore Richardson, has a question, and then we'll have uh, Councilmember Green who has a question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I hear a little echo. Is that me? OK, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Sharon, uh, to your office and for all the work that you've done. I just wanted to to quickly ask a few questions uh, relative to uh, some of your testimony wherein you stated the film office has an economic impact of over $300 million in Philadelphia. So can you detail for us for this hearing specifically what kinds of businesses and jobs are created as a result uh, of the work, not only of your office, but all the films uh, that are filmed here? Um, thank you for that question. Um, I, I think I in my in my testimony I talked about the different kinds of you know some sampling of of the kinds of jobs. Um, I, I think it's one of the most exciting things that happened in in the last couple of weeks were two interns of ours um, who had just you know been remote interns um, when a, a small film um, that was um, that was. Uh, shooting in Philadelphia, and they needed location scouts. These two interns ended up getting a job right right away and worked as location scouts on this particular um, on this particular film um, called Chestnut. And um, and that's just a small example of the kinds of careers that are being created by all of the other jobs that that we have mentioned. So. Um, we are shooting something, multiple things every single day, and there's everyone from caterers to dress to um, seamstresses to actors. Uh, you will hear from a number of people um, who are also going to testify today about the kinds of jobs that are created. Um, I, I could go on and on. I don't know if this sufficiently answered your question. Hello? Yes. OK, excellent. So uh, if you could also talk to us about your office and your office's collaboration with the city. I'm sorry for the background noise. <laughs> Can yes. you talk to us about your office's collaboration with the city of Philadelphia? Yes, well, I, I, I also specifically spoke about the different departments that we work with on a daily basis. Um, law department um, to make sure that the filmmakers all have contracts. Uh, we work very closely with managing director's office, which have been great heroes of ours and tremendous to work with. As I mentioned, we work with the health department during COVID, um, where we wanted to make sure that each and every film during the raging, the, the, the most difficult part of COVID when we were filming, to make sure that everyone was on board and that the protocols were, were safely um, followed. Um, we um, uh, we work with police on a very regular basis in the streets. Um, ev every single city department um, is are our friends um, and colleagues, and so nothing happens outside of the different film departments. Sure. And then of the three hundred and sixty eight projects that happened last fiscal year, even without uh, funding, uh, can you talk to us about how you think uh, we could bring more business to Philadelphia with, uh, you know, fully restoring support to your office? Well, uh, th that's thank you for that question. Um, there is, I think that the the industry in general um, is very aware. The film industry in general is very aware of the fact that the Greater Philadelphia Film Office um, has been cut off by city funding. They're watching very carefully um, to see what happens in this case. Um, their concern, as is mine, that if we are not able to secure additional funding, and hopefully City Council will support that, um, they're concerned that the Greater Philadelphia Film Office will be, be reduced or eliminated altogether 
uh, without financial support. And in that case, there is not a filmmaker anywhere that um, that will want to come and make films in Philadelphia without the support of a professional film commission. Um, so there, everyone is watching to see what's happening in Philadelphia. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony and for your work. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Councilwoman Gilmore Richardson. Uh, Councilmember Green, you have questions? Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, um, Council uh, Member Catherine Gilmore Richardson, for um, this conversation. And Sharon, thank you for being here and testifying regarding uh, this important need. I know we've talked over the years um, in many different ways of trying to promote the work um, that you're doing, even at one point trying to think about the possibility of a local tax credit um, within the city of Philadelphia to support the film office. I think it's very unfortunate that we're in this space currently in reference to the film office that you're basically um, gasping to survive. Um, we should not be in this place. Um, when you think about um, what is happening in other uh, cities around the nation in reference to the support they receive um, regarding um, their local um, uh, film offices and how it provides economic benefit for those jurisdictions. Um, anyone that watches almost any TV show sees made in Georgia um, on uh, at the end of the credits, and that's based on the close working relationship that former Mayor um, Reed and um, I believe um, Governor Deal at that time worked closely together to make sure that that film industry grew dramatically in um, the state of Georgia and the city of Atlanta that really did not have much of an industry before um, uh, 1990. Uh, in addition, even in the District of Columbia, uh, you know, right before the pandemic, I had an opportunity to tour um, the, the Mayor's Office of Film, Music, and Arts, and they were able to receive the former um, Black Entertainment Television Studios for a dollar, and they actually do all kinds of original content and programming and brought in industry veterans from both music and the film industry from Hollywood and New York back to DC to grow that entity to a much to incredible type of organization that creates new content and has a whole host of things. And even locally, the work that you've done and as a board member for both Gerard College and the Board of City Trust, and I know Councilmember Squill is also a member of the Board of City Trust, and we've seen the great work that even really in the, not that long ago you've done with Gerard College exposing young people to the film industry um, as well as providing an opportunity for revenue for Gerard College by having a number of productions use that space. So I guess my my concern is you said the industry is watching. Um, can you be a little more specific in reference to what you think may occur um, to the industry that we've helped to create over the years um, from when Governor Rendell was mayor to where we are if we don't have the type of funding that's needed to keep your organization not just sustainable but thriving what type of impact will they have not just on films but tv and all the ancillary um businesses that have been created because of the work of the film office over the years thank you, thank you. really excellent question um Councilman, uh, I think, um, you know, when I say that the industry is watching, I think I'm speaking specifically about filmmakers who wish to shoot in Philadelphia. Um, they know that we're on a very tight schedule and tether, and, and will we continue to be able to support their productions? We have, um, we have Lee Daniels is coming in coming back, native Philadelphian, coming back to do a movie this winter with on, starring Andre Day, um, who was his star in the United States versus Billie Holiday. They're doing a film here in January. Um, we just got a tax credit from the state for um, the fourth film from Sarah Megan Thomas, another Philadelphian who is a, the director of a film that is called um, Audrey's Children about the birth the story of the birth of the Ronald McDonald House. These are 
Philadelphia stories. These are Philadelphia filmmakers. They're always going to be dedicated to us. But if we're not here and all of those other filmmakers that come that are not Philadelphia centric, Netflix coming here to shoot a hustle, um, Mayor of Easttown, I don't know that you're, I think everybody watched it and uh, loved it and it's hoping for a second season. But did you know that a, quite a lot of that television series was shot in Philadelphia, not just Delaware County? All of those scenes in the woods were all in Fairmount Park in, in, uh, and handled through Parks and Rec. I mean, those are departments that we work with on a daily basis. Um, but it will only be some very, very small producers or, or producers of television commercials and in-house kinds of projects that would, would be going on. We'd be losing the kind of productions that really um, get our, our citizens excited and really bring in a large economic impact. It's, it's really critical that we, um, that we have that. And, and just a follow-up, because I think you're so so on point in reference to the opportunity that we've been able to sell Philadelphia stories from that are very unique to Philadelphia from Count Concrete Cowboy to PDR and the Philadelphia Department of Recreation. And I see my colleague Council Member Curtis Jones and Council Member Squilla know the um, young lady I call the Jim Ellis of rowing uh, in reference to the work that Brandon Johnson's done in reference to rowing. And she's already been in um, conversations and there's a uh, a film about a Chicago rowing team. I think there should be a film about the work that she's done right here in the city of Philadelphia. And I think we lose those opportunities when we don't have a film office. Um, one last question. Um, we received those tax credits through the Commons Pennsylvania. Uh, I know Pittsburgh also did a lot of work in this space. If the film office is not in the position that it's been in the past, what happens to tax credits at the Commonwealth level? Because that's something that we've been struggling to hold on to for a number of years. If there's not a Philadelphia film office, what happens to the state tax credits in reference to film? That's a very pointed, excellent question, um, Councilman. Um, clearly, if there's not a film commission in Philadelphia going forward, all of that tax credit money is going to go to Pittsburgh. We're already fighting, you know, where my colleague in Pittsburgh and I are constantly um, ch challenged by the state to try to get our bigger share of the tax credits so that we can create more jobs where we are, each of us are. Um, some years we're even, some years we've been ahead, other years Pittsburgh has been ahead. Um, and clearly, if if um, if you, there's not a professional film commission in Philadelphia, there won't be any tax credits in Philadelphia either. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Are there any other questions um, for Sharon on this panel? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, Councilmember Rao. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, good morning. Um, I I want to uh, first of all uh, thank you for your not only your work but your you know your pioneering work but your your advocacy. Uh, you certainly have been out there um, informing the public, informing. Um, uh, decision makers informing the business community about the impact of filmmaking, how important it is to our city, what it's done to uplift our city. Um, and I just have to ask, in light of what seems to be something that almost everybody knows, the impact of filmmaking in Philadelphia, the jobs, the tax, the taxes that are paid and, and everything, um, what is the disconnect? Why, why are we looking at um, a continuous defunding of the of the uh, Greater Philadelphia Film Office, a zeroing out of of your budget, uh, and now we have a transfer ordinance coming up, an opportunity to put money back in. Uh, what has been the problem that, despite what everybody says, how great the film office is, how important it is to our city, that the money keeps disappearing and doesn't come back in? I, 
Councilman, thank you. I wish I knew the answer. Do we do too what good of a job? Do you know? Should we should we fail so that people will see that we really need that funding? We we've. I mean, I I and my staff took fifty percent pay cuts last year in July, and and I don't know about you, but how would you like to live on half of your paycheck? Um, you know, we we scraped and and begged and got you know some small grants here and there some some support um and i was able during this last year to um to restore my all my my four staff members to their previous salaries as of july 1 incrementally and finally on july 1 they got back to their last year's salaries before it was cut in and i'm at 65 percent of my salary to this day i i don't uh, you know, it, this is more than a job for all of us, not just me, but everyone on my team and everyone that works in this industry is so committed and so in love with our storytelling and the way that we're able to really impact the culture and and re and reflect on the culture. And our American culture is greatly important. And our Philadelphia culture, we work very hard to do as much of this filmmaking that really reflects who we are in this city and in this region. I I, I don't know. I can't I can't give you a good answer. I'm sorry. I just I just wanted to um, point out that uh, during the COVID nineteen. Investments were made in, in television and film production. Uh, there was an announcement right when everything was shut down that Netflix uh, invested $500 million in South Korean films and, and television. I wish that money came to Philadelphia. Uh, what kind of timeline are you on? What, what, what is our timeline to get you some money? Last year. <laughs> Last year, I think. Yeah, I mean, in all seriousness, it is, it is pretty dire. It is. It is. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, everybody. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Councilmember Jones. So I'm not even going to date you as to how far back we we go. I just cite that I was a Commerce Department employee way back then, um, and and know the importance of this office. I guess to answer member O's question, the squeaky wheel kind of gets the oil and you just perform your duties in that office so efficiently that you don't take the time to squeak loud enough, but um, it is even better when other members squeak for you. Um, I would say that um, I've been on a few film sets. Um, I was in um, Brotherly Love, uh, and I was the merchant that got robbed in the beginning of the movie. Go on Netflix, you can see it. Uh, but that might have had 20 takes with the block cut off with economic development through um, how those cast members were going to get paid, the members themselves, the people who did the makeup, the wardrobe uh, trailer that was brought in, the extras that got paid as well, the temporary impact is one thing. The long-term message rec recognition of our city is timeless. Um, people say, yeah, I saw Overbrook in that, and, you know, I, where is the Belmont Plateau. Most recently, I was on a set of Concrete Cowboy. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm vying for a, a, a small part in Concrete Cowboy 2, which is scheduled to come here. But I was in South Philadelphia, I believe in Whatever. Robert Johnson's district, when That's they just bear. did the remake for- Councilmember Jones, hold on one second. Uh, Councilmember Green, did you want to make a point of information? Yeah, point of information. Um, Councilmember Jones, would you be taking the place of Idris Alba in that remake? <laughs> I just think you have a much 
much better profile so I, catcher than Mr. I, I don't uh, I don't want to <laughs> elongate this hearing, but at the Concrete Cowboy, which uh, the set was in uh, Councilman Clark's district, I came dressed up in full regalia. I know. <laughs> trying to get in. And they, they said, well, we have all the extras we need. But in the Will Smith remake that they're doing, the yeah. series, um, uh, they blocked off a whole park in Member Johnson's district. There, it, it was a whole city out there, including police officers, wardrobe, security, and it is a major undertaking. Um, and, and so these impacts even are, are larger than on paper. So we need to fight for this. Every time Philadelphia gets shown in a favorable light, it is a international commercial. Uh, and we just need to treasure it a little more. My question becomes, what cities, What if we were to imitate three cities that do it right, who are they? Um. Let's see, uh, I, so do, who does it right? Um, well, I would say, um, I don't know that anybody does it all. I mean, Pittsburgh does a good job. I would say that, that Boston does a good job. Chicago wow. does a good job. New, I mean, New York is, um, does a great job as well. Um, you know, I think that, that you know, that those are, those how, are. How does, things. how does your budget compare to theirs? It's not, it's. I don't even know. <laughs> I really don't. Um, you know, I know that a, a number of uh, a number of film commissions. Film commissions are either wholly government, so that they are a part of government, and the other half are nonprofits, like we are. Um, and I, I, I'm happy to do that research for you, Councilman, and let you know what the other cities are getting that are Thank that are nonprofits. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Jones. And then um, also I want to recognize uh, before we recognize Council Member Dom, I, if, if there was an extra out there and I needed somebody, I would select you, Council Member Jones, to be uh, one of those extras and maybe a good idea in future will shoots that we have. But uh, um, Council Member Dom. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to thank my colleague, Councilmember Kathy Gilmore Richardson for bringing this resolution to us. And Sharon, also want to thank you for all your work. And Sharon, what is the specific dollar ask for today? Uh, I my ask is, you know, what I would what I'd like is to get back the two years of, of funding that we lost. I, I think we should we should get um, two hundred thousand dollars a year at the film office. So is the ask two hundred thousand or is it ask four hundred thousand? I, I would, I would say, I would like the previous years and going forward, two hundred thousand. Okay, and then I just want to make sure I understand. Uh, you know, in any uh, business or anywhere, the rainmaker in the organization is the most valuable person. That's the person who brings in the business. And sometimes we don't recognize that in government. But I just want to be clear that I think you had in your information that for every dollar we invest in the Greater Philadelphia Film Office. Is it $623 comes back to us? I think that, uh, 623, I, there's also been a number of 638. It's something, uh, and I'm not sure starting on what year, but that gives you a very general um, idea of the impact of the very small amount of money that we get um, from the city. And it, it's, not, it's not reasonable at all. There's no balance there. So I would say this, especially coming out of COVID, and making sure that not just the film, but our travel organizations are fully funded even more than before, it's important for the city of Philadelphia to come back because people now have choices. They can go anywhere and they can live anywhere. And the key to Philadelphia is to make that lifestyle and the culture key. And we can do that through film by showing people, I mean, how many times have you watched a film and said, oh, I know that location, or people come to the city and say, oh, I want to see the Rockies or whatever it is. They want to see different things that have occurred in prior films. Anyway, I'm not going to belabor this. I'm a full support of the funding you're requesting. And Mr. Chair, um, 
I have uh, no other comments, but I want to thank you. And this is a no brainer. There's no way we can't support you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Council Member Dom. I see we have um, another question. Um, Kathy, you want to uh, just make a quick comment? Yeah, quick comments, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to thank you and all of our colleagues for your unwavering support uh, for the Philadelphia Film Office. Thank you. I don't I double down on that. Thank you. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Uh, if there's no further questions, we'll go to the next uh, panel to testify. Oh. Mr. McMonagle, you want to read the names of the next panel? Can we please have Lendl Tellington, Julius Walker, Diane Heary, and Sharon Pinkinson again? All right, thank you so much, Lendl, and everybody with a follow on that order. Uh, just state your name for the record and then proceed with your testimony. We'll wait till everybody's done testifying if there's any questions. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lyndall Tellington. I'm the tech director at the Black Star Film Festival. I've been living in Philadelphia for the past 14 years and been a tech director at Black Star Projects for the past seven years. Uh, Black Star Projects is the home of the Black Star Film Festival, and for the past decade, our mission has been to provide a platform for films about and by Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities from around the world. In addition to our festival, we produce an annual filmmaker seminar, a Philadelphia Filmmaker Lab, exhibitions, year-round screening program, and a semi-annual film journal and about film and visual culture. Our team of curators, writers, and cultural workers are also filmmakers, including myself. My connection to the Greater Philadelphia Film Office spans my time in Philadelphia, both as a filmmaker and in my work at Black Star. I was 20 years old attending college when I was invited to the 15th anniversary screening of Philadelphia starring Denzel Washington and Tom Hanks. It was there where I met the late director Jonathan Demme, a favorite director of mine, who spoke about the relationship between Christy Zia, the film's associate producer and the Greater Philadelphia Film Office. It was the first time that I grasped the importance of a film office and its connecting the dots between the army municipality and the production needs in order to bring cinema to life. Years later, I'm on set getting my first film credit as a part of a camera crew on an independent film that started as a winning script from the Greater Philadelphia Film Office's screenwriting competition. It was this experience that truly gave me a sense of how independent cinema is made. But it was the prize from the Greater Philadelphia Film Office that allowed this production to get off the ground. Black Star has partnered with the Greater Philadelphia Film Office on programming, including screenings of a festival circuit darlings, as well as locally produced films from our city's BIPOC communities who make up 51% of Philadelphia's population. I had the honor of presenting my work in one of these screenings and panel discussions. What I find vital about this is it's not just the platform it provides for filmmakers, but the opportunity for Philadelphia's BIPOC media makers to connect. These spaces foster a collaboration while inspiring the next generation of filmmakers by being able to see professionals who look like themselves. Film and television centering Philadelphia stories is distributed through streaming platforms, screening theaters and tour festival circuits, reaching millions around the world. We cannot underestimate, underestimate the necessary role the Greater Philadelphia Film Office has in supporting these productions and a role the film festival programming has in bringing audiences to experience these films in our city. Film and television are the media ambassadors for our city. It is these stories and storytellers that the Greater Philadelphia Film Office works alongside to fulfill their productions and maintain a code of conduct and ethics for those Philadelphians working on set of these productions. From location scouting and permits to catering and monetary incentives, the Greater Philadelphia Film Office supports the productions that become the moving images millions across the world come to know Philadelphia through. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Linda, for your testimony. Uh, you want to just proceed down? Um, I don't know if Julius or who is next. I guess Julius should go next. Just state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. We'll hold questions until the end. Thank you. Julius, you're muted. I'm sorry. You could try to unmute yourself. Good morning. How you doing? My name is Julius Walker, uh, principal at Epic Tech Group. 
uh, in my testimony, the Greater Philadelphia Film Office was very influential in the development of our previous company, New Millennium Studios. Uh, upon acquiring the studio, the Greater Philadelphia Film Office uh, assists in identifying the necessary processes to meet the requirements of both local and national clients. Uh, being labeled as the old E.J. Stewart building, the Greater Philadelphia Film Office uh, immediately provided knowledge on the impact of our building had on the film uh, and video industry, not only facility wise, but more importantly, the creation of several crew members careers. The Greater Philadelphia Film Office was a true advocate for minority owned businesses and positioning tangible opportunities within the film and video industry. Our team utilized our our resources provided by the Greater Philadelphia Film Office by leveraging the existing network to maximize outreach to funnel clients and professional talent. Based on our relationship, we were able to employ several underprivileged individuals to learn and experience the film and video industry at a very high level. The Concrete Cowboy contract is a great example of how beneficial the Greater Philadelphia Film Office is to the local area. Sharon Pinkinson and her team recommended and worked with us to secure the contract to provide production offices and soundstage rentals for the production uh, for the Concrete Cowboy production. This opportunity required us to obtain a certification as a tax credit approved film facility. Our team worked directly with the Greater Philadelphia Film Office to complete and verify all requirements and work closely to speed up the approval process. By completing this process, our business was able to hire local crews and attract several mid-level productions increasing uh, substantially. Over the years, Sharon Pinkinson and her team has maintained and demonstrated commitment uh, the Greater Philadelphia has to assisting, fueling, and nurturing the rich offerings that Philadelphia and surrounding areas can and has provided for all ranges of production. Without a fully funded Greater Philadelphia Film Office, it would have been an uphill battle not only in getting traction into the studio, but also maintaining it. I truly believe that the Greater Philadelphia Film Office is very important to the continuous success in attracting national productions into Philadelphia and the surrounding areas. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Diane. I think you were next. If you want to just state your name for the record and then proceed. Hi, my name is Diane Heary. Um, I'm a casting director here in Philadelphia. Along with my business partner, Jason Loftus, we're a Pennsylvania company. We cast actors in the extras in feature films, television shows, commercials, live events, anywhere you need an actor. We're also some of the people who help create economic development by supporting those who produce screen content in Philadelphia. Now, and first and foremost, this is an industry. It's a business. It's, it's called show business for a reason. And the movie production business shoots in our area because it's good business for them. We're competing on a national and global stage. And our record shows that Philly can compete successfully. Philly ranks among some of the top locations in the country, in the world, to shoot in the area. Um, but like most businesses that would be coming into a new market, that project's always going to seek out the local entity, the, the governmental entity, entity that's going to help them with their project. Um, they look for support and guidance from the local film offices. So it's important that we have that film office here for that kind of support. It's always been about jobs here. Each production employs an average of 250 crew members, 1,500 extras, 50 act actors, and, and they spend money here. They, they need hotel rooms, they do rental cars, they buy lumber, they buy paint. Uh, you've heard all this before, we've said it, other people have said it already, but they spend money here and it's important to have it. But to maintain that healthy industry here in Philadelphia, they look for support. And that support is the Greater Philadelphia Film Office. And they've been here for us for over 25 years. And it is kind of astounding to me that the funding was even pulled to begin with. Anyway, I'm going off my script here. Um, the Philadelphia area really needs a viable film office to help maintain the growth of this industry. And, and that does mean funding. I mean, the word Philadelphia is in the Greater Philadelphia Film Office. And, and the Philadelphia and, and our citizens, they benefit from all the hard work that the film office does. It seems only fair and fitting that the city of Philadelphia restores this funding that they previously had granted to the film office to keep us moving forward. Um, we want to ensure the economic growth in, the, in, in Philadelphia and let it really blossom here in Philadelphia. We have such potential. 
we really support reinstating this funding and as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I know uh, Sharon, I think you wanted to testify again. Or on behalf of someone. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize that that was the I was asked to um, testify for. I can't remember. See whose testimony that was. I'm so sorry. Um, that's, that's all right if you wanted to. Um, do you know whose testimony that was? I'm sorry. I um, it just has your name there on behalf of. Hold on. Is it a David Ringer? David? Oh, David Rayner. Yeah, Rainer. let me see if I can find his testimony. In the meantime, okay. I got it. I've oh, got you have it. it? Okay. All I right. do. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, if you so want to read I'm, I'm speaking on I'm speaking on behalf of David Rayner. To the members of Philadelphia City Council, good morning. I'm happy to be at today's hearing regarding resolution 210643. Interestingly, I just produced a commercial campaign this weekend that the Greater Philadelphia Film Office assisted me with. I've been a part of the Philadelphia film community for close to 25 years. The Greater Philadelphia Film Office, GPFO, and Sharon Pinkinson are synony synonymous with film production in Philadelphia and the surrounding area. Ask any out-of-state producer who their first point of contact is when they consider bringing a new project to a city. Without hesitation, they will tell you that they, that they contact the city's film commissioner. A city's film office is a critical infrastructure that is needed as a first and often last point of contact for any sized project. This includes, but is not limited to broadcast television commercials, multi-season television shows, and studio feature films. One of the most critical roles of the film commissioner is to sell their city to a production so that they elect to film in their city. In turn, that city receives a direct economic boost of significant proportions. We, the local crew, are hired. With the tax incentives firmly in place, productions are required to spend an allotted amount in the state they are filming. Pennsylvania businesses boom when a production is in town. Everything from hotels to rental car facilities and even independently owned stores benefit. Film and television production provides economic stability and the ability for businesses to stay afloat. What happens if there's no film commissioner or no film office infrastructure? I had to give a pause while writing this letter as it's something I'd never considered. I honestly can't imagine a world without a Philadelphia film office and a commissioner as strong as Sharon. The film office does so much more than sell the city. They help facilitate a production during every step of the way. From pre-production through wrap, they are there supporting a production and its team. The Philadelphia film and television community has relied countlessly on Sharon to assist in finding production office space, obtain permits to film on city streets, and so much more. The presence of a film office and its commissioner is absolutely critical to the city of Philadelphia. Without one, we will almost certainly lose productions that would have considered filming in Philadelphia and the surrounding area. The loss of the economic impact that one feature film brings to our city is unfathomable. Production work in Philadelphia and the surrounding area not only provides economic growth, it also creates jobs, garners interest for tourism, and creates a buzz for the city that often goes worldwide. I have enjoyed working with Sharon in the Greater Philadelphia Film Office for nearly a quarter of a century. I can say with utter conviction that I do not know how I would have gotten through some of the productions I've been on without their support. I look forward to working with them for many years to come. Respectfully, David Rayner, producer. Thank you, Sharon, for your testimony. Um, I know uh, Councilwoman uh, Gilmore Richardson. 
Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And I won't be labor and I wanted to, to quickly get in a few of these questions, uh, knowing that we have a very long hearing today. But thank you all so much uh, for your testimony to Lyndall, Julius, Diane and David in his absence for uh, all of your testimony. And to Lyndall, I wanted to thank you especially for sharing your personal story and ask you if you could elaborate on how the film office really helps to, to foster talent in Philadelphia's communities and how you work with the office. Yeah, I mean, I think for me more specifically, um, speaking from, a, from my perspective as a filmmaker, I think what the film office does is sort of provide the infrastructure to, and also to assure that when filmmakers go on to set, that like their their well being, their pay, the ethics of a set are actually abided by. And I think that's really important, especially given the things we're seeing happen in Hollywood now, with their strikes happening right now, where people are, are questioning um, uh, equitable sort of pay and stuff like that. So I think for me, more than anything, that is like the very the very, very important work that needs to be done, but also just on a very basic level in terms of just like being able to eat. <laughs> like that's the, that's really basic for me. And I think for what I mentioned before, is just the infrastructure that it provides and, and community it provides. Because sometimes, you know, we can be in our silos as filmmakers, we're artists, yeah. but what the, what the film office does is sort of give a space where we can kind of commune and congregate. I mean, the film festival is happening right now, Black Star happened two months ago. And those are platforms with which filmmakers begin to see themselves outside of their themselves and begin to see that it's an ecosystem. And I think that's what the Greater Philadelphia Film Office does best is, is sort of tie everything that's within the ecosystem of filmmaking in the, of the filmmaking industry in Philadelphia. And I think it's the word, I say that we're an ecosystem because it's like you have the people who are working on the ground, you have folks who don't live in Philadelphia who are coming to the city who need to become acclimated. You have the folks who are working on sets, you have the folks who are in the equipment offices who are providing that equipment. And that is putting food on the table for a lot of those people. And, uh, and the, the and the entity that connects all those dots is the Greater Philadelphia Film Office. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that, if that answers your question, but. Yes, that was great. And then I wanted to ask you from your perspective as a filmmaker, um, how is Philadelphia as a city uh, able to compete with other major film hubs and what role do you think our film office plays in that, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we've seen increasingly that people are very interested in Philadelphia as a location to film. I think the discrepancy here is that when you don't provide funding for a place that is really the backbone for these <laughs> for these uh, productions to get done, is that they'll look to other cities. Yeah. You know? I mean, if that if there isn't if there isn't an entity like the film office here, they'll look to a Baltimore. They'll look to other places that might have a cheaper tax credit, but have the same sort of like, um, what would you say, sort of like accessibility in terms of locations. You could get a city, you could get you know, you could go out into the burbs and film stuff, but oftentimes people are coming to Philadelphia because there's so much surrounding Philadelphia, and um, while you can still get those you know those locations that you might like uh, like Sharon mentioned earlier. In Mayor Easttown, you can go to Fairmount and you make it double for a particular place, or you can shoot in a city like Philadelphia and it could double as Baltimore because the tax credit might be might not be great in another city. And we lose those opportunities when there's not an infrastructure here for those for those um, productions to look to, you know. And um, I think for me individually, and what I've been noticing more and more, especially. Um, over the past, I would say, 14 years that I've lived here in the city, that the like the film community in Bal I'm sorry, in in Philadelphia has like grown exponentially. Um, so I will say, like at Black Star, we screen at least 10 to 12 in the, in our festival. We have year-round screening, but in our festival, we have at least was it 10 to 12 percent of the the films that screen there are just from Philadelphians. So I think what we lose <laughs> when we don't have an entity like the um, film office here is that that conversation. And, um, and it, is, it is those entities that allow for that conversation to, to grow beyond the borders of our city. Um, because the, when you go into the, the, well, go into the film office's website, you're gonna see all the productions that take place here. And you know that your HBOs, your Netflixes, they're looking at those productions being like, oh, these, these, these are the budgets that match what we do. And they also got the infrastructure from a film office that exists here. And, you know, I mean, like Sharon said in the beginning, like those cities are, those cities, those productions are also looking at us. Um, I think the one thing that really stands out too is that people are coming here, like populations of people are coming here during the pandemic. More people moved from New York than from Philly to New York. So, and a lot of those people are filmmakers and we're seeing that same thing take place in Atlanta 
And I think Philadelphia is really right for becoming a place similar to Atlanta, where it could be a hub, a, um, a lightning bolt for, for uh, growing the film industry. But if there's no film office there to support that, then things could be run in disarray and go by the wayside. And I think the big thing for me is making sure the filmmakers, the set designers, the builders have the support of a film office that makes sure their best needs are taken care of because things are getting... <laughs> people are trying to cut nu uh, cut numbers, and I think we have a film office involved. They're going to make sure that people who are the citizens of Philadelphia are taken care of. Sure. No, thank you very, very much for that response, and uh, thank you for all of your work and really helping us to understand how uh, you interface with the film office. I wanted to quickly ask Julius um, if he could elaborate more on a, a part of his testimony around the film office being a true advocate for minority-owned businesses. Um, and I wanted to ask you, would you have been able to secure a contract on a major production like Concrete Cowboys if not for the film office? Um, and just my understanding of having several other contracts um, enter into our system, um, I don't believe so. Um, the level of exposure that um, that the film office provided us at that time um, was was far to none. Um, We've had a lot of opportunities that had came our way, um, but the direct communication that Sharon and her team provided, one of the things that Concrete Cowboy uh, came to us as being a tax credit um, approved facility. And in dealing with the state, when it comes to getting to approval process, it is an extreme uphill battle on getting the right certifications done properly, uh, moving the the emails through people's emails. Uh, we had a, a, a instance where we sent out an email. We didn't hear anything for about three weeks. And Sharon and her team kept following up and say, hey, um, are you guys? waiting to hear and we reached back out to Sharon and said yes we submitted all documentation required and within two days of sharing and her team reaching out we had some traction moving so uh being in a, mi a minority owned business um a lot of things uh tend not to show up as much as um as other uh, demographics in my opinion um and the film office provided tangible opportunities not the ones that you might get an email and they like the space and then it goes away they actually continue to pursue the opportunity with you to allow us to be able to you know hire on on you know underprivileged um to be honest african-american males and females to be able to see the film industry at that level so i do think they were very very influential in for us getting that contract and maintaining it and providing the level of excellence that uh, is required to uh, to maintain that type of client. Oh, well, thank you very, very much for your testimony and for your work. And congratulations to you and your company. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Dom. That, that was a prior uh, comment. We already covered it, uh, Mr. Chair, we're good. Oh, OK, all right. Um, your chat's working again, I guess. Uh, but let's see. Is there any other questions to this panel before we go to the next panel? Yes, I have a comment and a question. Councilman Rowe. Thank you very much. For, first, uh, my comment is really this uh, in, in response to a question that was raised. Um, New York's Office of Media and Entertainment, which is an office under the Department of Cultural Affairs, reported that um, film and television sector uh, was responsible for $82 billion in economic output. That included um, 185,000 jobs and $18 billion in wages. Um, that uh, kind of impact um, also um, uh, is part of uh, New York City's um, cultural affairs office and 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 in in our efforts we have been in touch with that office but funding wise the uh, New York City's cultural affairs department uh, is funded with 193.1 million dollars and that's a cut from last year when they received 209.9 .9 million dollars so clearly New York City understands the economic value uh, of jobs, uh, tax revenues, and everything else that is involved in, in what is um, the uh, creative arts economy. I say that because it is still a struggle in this city to elevate the conversation about the creative arts economy to like real jobs, real profession, real industry, a constant struggle. 
Um, and uh, I will just ask um, in terms of this panel, um, is there anyone on this panel that is not aware of the um, local tax uh, credit that has been introduced for uh, film and television? I'm going to I'm going to ask, is everyone aware that a that a bill has been introduced to create a local tax incentive for film and television? Yes, Councilman, I certainly am. I was help. I was uh, on your committee actually to help uh, create it. And yes. we're very appreciative of the fact that you took that initiative to to make something happen for us. Yeah, th thank you for, you know, uh, you know your work and and all of your work on behalf of the city of Philadelphia with the uh, the the uh, film and television uh, task force. Um, for for the other people on the panel, uh, did you have a chance to advocate for funding last year and this year with a you know during the budget the first budget cut? Did you reach out to the administration? Did you reach out to folks about? not cutting the budget or restoring the budget did everyone was there were you aware of that yeah our team was a part of i mean a, um, a part of a, a larger sort of consortium that talks about arts and culture here in philadelphia um last year um I'm, i can't speak to this year but last year that was that we were part of a larger consortium that talked about arts culture and we spoke from the perspective as filmmakers um last year okay thank you very much thank you Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Mr. McMonagall, uh, can you please read the titles of the next panel? Yes, can we please have Siku Campbell, Evan O'Donnell, and Sylvia Bastani, please? All right, if we, uh, what we could do is start in that order. Just state your first name, I mean your name, and uh, then proceed with your testimony. Uh, please proceed. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Seku Campbell. Um, sorry, I'm just pulling up my testimony here. Okay. <laughs> Take your time. I can ask the other testifiers, just uh, just be ready uh, as soon as the say two is completed. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, my name is Seku Campbell. Uh, good morning to Council Member Squilla and the members of the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. I'm a resident of South Philadelphia, a partner at the national law firm Colhane Meadows PLLC and co-chair of Black Star Projects. You heard one of our great staff members testify previously. I join you this morning in response to resolution number 216043. Um, I'm going to sort of limit some of my written testimony. I think much of, of what I wrote uh, has already been said, so I'll, I'll spare the committee the redundancy. Uh, through the GPFO, our firm, Colleen Meadows, has represented a number of artists, producers, and companies in matters ranging from pre-production through to distribution of films. Beyond the GPFO, we have represented a range of similar functionaries in the film industry doing deals with Warner Media, Netflix, Hulu, PBS, Viacom, CBS, and other sim similar media companies. In addition, I serve as co-chair of Black Star Projects, host of Philadelphia's most preeminent film, film festival, Black Star Film Festival. To quote Terrence Nance, uh, most recently of Space Jam fame, he directed Space, uh, Space Jam, Black Star is by far the most important and affecting film festival in the world. Uh, 
what I'd like to do where I think I can be most helpful to the committee is, is to telescope back and discuss the film industry writ large. Uh, I can provide, I, I didn't provide this with my testimony, but I can provide to the committee a report commissioned by a network of international film commission associations um, in uh, a study by Alsberg SPI with the support of Media Business Insight it's titled Screen Production, the Impact of Film and Television Production on Economic Recovery from COVID-19. It provided groundbreaking detailed economic data of film and television production, including a robust, robust measure of how much is invested globally in screen production and its economic impact around the world, as well as the breadth and speed of economic effect screen production delivers. According to the report, the direct economic output of the global screen production sector uh, outstrip, which is $177 billion, outstrips the electric motor vehicle and robotics industrial and service sectors combined. The direct output in North America is for more than $90 billion and combined with indirect or induced sector output, that total category over $200 billion. The total number of full-time equivalent jobs created by the screen production sector exceeds 2.5 million in North America. Also, screen productions, and I quote the report here, can be likened to major specialist high-tech manufacturing operations that quickly arise, expend huge sums, and employ hundreds of people. Major productions, for example, can spend upwards of $10 million per week for 16 straight weeks during a production and would bolster other hard hit business sectors like travel, hospitality, real estate, power and utilities, construction, and business support. In short, those cities that value the attraction of screen production to their communities will enjoy a quick and powerful, and the pun is intended here, booster to their economy. Because consumer appetites are voracious, these numbers are bound to grow. With respect to Philadelphia specifically, I would urge the committee to consider the opportunity costs with respect to screen production in this city. Failing to spend on a film commission now would be penny wise and pound foolish. Perhaps the city can save a few hundred thousand dollars by failing to fund the GPFO, but it would lose the opportunity to establish a beachhead in a growing, highly lucrative industry well suited for Philadelphia's infrastructure. In short, cutting the GPFO budget would be the equivalent of spending millions of dollars and thousands of jobs in the city. So the question I would pose to this committee is why would expending such resources out of the city justify such a small, small short-term savings? With respect to intangible benefits of a vibrant film community, I would ask what does the city say to its citizenry when it fails to, to support film in the city, but continues, for example, to support police at the same levels? A film may not stop a bullet, but it can stop the shooting hand. If the city thinks that it cannot afford the purported luxury of a film industry when it must deal with other problems, one must consider the genesis of those problems. The power of art of any kind is its ability to help both practitioners and audience members to imagine a world distinct from what exists now. Now more than ever, we must exercise that imagination muscle by supporting and hosting screen productions in this city. While there is no doubt that Philadelphians heavily rely on our invaluable city servants, it is hard to imagine a world where film, television, and other arts and entertainment, inter entertainment media don't exist during these trying times. Finally, it is important to understand what we say to the community when we invest millions of dollars in policing our communities, while also telling the same body politic that insufficient funds exist to support an important arts organization. The city expresses that it is more valuable, in my opinion, to control rather than free its citizens. The document penned in this city that gave this country its birth mentions useful arts, authors, speech, and debate. Never, though, does it mention police. To be clear, I express no opinion here about the validity of the police force itself. Rather, I express the importance of prioritizing freedom over control in this city if we are to tackle the important problems facing it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Sean, do you, who's next to testify? Right away. Can we please have Evan O'Donnell? 
Okay, Evan, just state your name for the record and proceed your testimony. Great. Uh, thank you, City Council members. Uh, my name is Evan O'Donnell, Regional Vice President for AKA, a division of Corman Communities. Good morning, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak on behalf of Resolution 210-643 today in support of the need for funding <clears throat> for Greater Philadelphia Film Office. Corman Communities is a locally owned and operated fourth generation real estate company, providing a wide array of accommodations and housing options uh, to the community. Corman Communities employs over 300 team members in the greater Philadelphia region, 60% of which are operational with variable departments such as housekeeping, maintenance, front office, front services, and food and beverage directly impacted by occupancy levels. Given our services, we've been working closely with the film industry and specifically the Greater Philadelphia Film Office for much of the last 15 years. Our properties within the city of Philadelphia and surrounding suburbs have been directly impacted by the marketing, recruitment, engagement, um, and promotional efforts of the Greater Philadelphia Film Office. Um, while the film production has been a presence in our brand for much of the last 15 years, it's been a brand saving impact during um, challenging times as film production was and is a force for us locally during economic crisis of 2018 and the pandemic crisis of 2020, which we all know has had um, a long term impact on travel and tourism communities into 2021 and beyond. The efforts of Sharon Pinkinson and her team at the Greater Philadelphia Film Office in attracting and retaining these productions that have provided a foundation of business in a time when other sources have all but disappeared cannot be overstated. Uh, in closing, given the growth we are seeing within the film production industry and the growing competition from other states and other regions within our state, it's imperative that Philadelphia uh, have the presence and force in marketing film production uh, for the greater Philadelphia region. And these, these uh, efforts require financial support of the region to be successful. On behalf of Corman Communities, I thank you for this opportunity to briefly share our support of the Greater Philadelphia Film Office, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Evan, thank you for your testimony. Uh, before we go to any questions, I'd like to complete the uh, panel. Um, Sylvia, or if you're yeah. next, do you want to state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Councilman Squill. It's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Sylvia Bastani, and I am the Chief Advancement Officer for Girard College and the Executive Director of the Fund for Girard College. And I'm honored um, to be speaking on behalf of uh, government funding for the Greater Philadelphia Film Office. In my role at Girard, I oversee philanthropic and earn revenues to support Girard College's historic mission of providing an excellent tuition-free residential education to underserved children ages 6 through 18 in Philadelphia and beyond. I also oversee Girard College's marketing and branding communications. Uh, as you know, Girard's uh, historic campus is located in North Philadelphia's Fairmount section. Um, and we have had long benefited from the uh, relationship that we have had with Sharon Pinkinson and the Greater Philadelphia Film Office. From being the filming location for 12 Monkeys, starring Brad Pitt, Safe, starring Jason Stratham, Annapolis starring James Franco, Creed II starring Sylvester Stallone, Hustle starring Adam Sandler, to Mayor of Easttown starring Kate Winslet, as well as several documentaries, Girard College has benefited from incredible exposure due to our campus becoming an attractive location for filmmakers. As you can imagine, many of our students have an interest in the arts, including the film and entertainment industry. It's also a great source of pride to the Girard community. Imagine our students' faces when Adam Sandler waved and said hello to them. 
These films are also important to Girard College's strategic vision of becoming a campus for the city, becoming a center of social impact. During the dark time in 2020, when our world shut down due to COVID, Sharon and the Greater Film Office secured two entertainment giants to film on our beautiful campus. Netflix used our armory to film Hustle, a film about basketball starring Adam Sandler, as well as HBO filming Mayor of Easttown, a limited series starring Kate Winslet and Guy Pierce that went on to Emmy Award winning success and introduced the world to the greater Philadelphia. Who can forget all those Wawa coffees and the murder dirter debate on social media? I have watched this series several times now, not just because I have a crush on Guy Pierce, but for the thrill of seeing many areas of our campus as the backdrop to such a successful quality film production. These two productions generated much needed revenues for Girard College just when the school was meeting unplanned expenses to purchase COVID test kits, masks, and other equipment to keep our students and campus safe. The film crews themselves provided rigorous COVID protocols, demonstrating that they too had safety in mind. The film crews brought hundreds of employees to Philadelphia. They hired out for food at local restaurants and catering companies, occupied hotel rooms, and generated income for our community during a severe economic downturn. That our film office can secure such amazing productions to our city is truly commendable as this is a very highly competitive space. I'm encouraged to learn that City Council is taking a closer look and investing in the Greater Philadelphia Film Office. In my role, I understand how investments can pay huge dividends. In the fundraising business, we say you, you got to invest money to make money. I believe that as Philadelphia seeks to draw corporate headquarters, large national conferences, the World Cup, and be a center of excellence, there's no greater advertisement for Philadelphia than being on the big screen and in the living rooms of millions of homes across America and the world. I thank you for taking the time to hear my testimony today. I thank you for investing in a greater Philadelphia film offices, unprecedented, exposure of our great city. Sylvia, thank you for your testimony. Much appreciated. <laughs> Mr. McMonagall, the next person to testify. Yes, can we please have Tommy O'Donnell and Frank Machos? Tom, you're available. Hi. Can I just state your name for the record and proceed, Tom? My name is Tom O'Donnell. I'm president of Theatrical Teamsters Local 817. I represent transportation workers in motion picture and television in the six state jurisdiction, including the state of Pennsylvania, east of Harrisburg. I'm also director of the motion picture and theatrical division for North America for the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. I like to say that filmmaking is not just about the arts. It's first and foremost the manufacturing industry, the manufacturing of content, and is the most highly mobile manufacturing industry in the world. And if conditions in a locale are deemed fertile, productions can arrive within months, and if conditions become infertile, they can leave within months. What are producers looking for in a location? First, they're looking for a financial incentive in the form of a tax credit or rebate. They look for a talent and crew base. They look for infrastructure in the form of stage and production facilities. And last but certainly not least, they look for ease of usage at a location. This is where the film offices are critical. They promote the locale. They are the key that unlocks its locations. They are the one-stop shop that makes it possible for producers to navigate city agencies, liaison with its citizens and communities, and manage the locations that are used in filming. I know of no locales in North America where there is a, that is a consistent film production center that does not have a vibrant, publicly supported film office, except for possibly Philadelphia. I thank you for this opportunity 
to provide this testimony and I look forward to any questions. Thank you, Tom, for your email. I'm not sure if Frank was next or Evan, but uh, Frank, if you want to state your name for the record and proceed. Sure, Frank Makos, uh, School District of Philadelphia, Office of the Arts and Creative Learning, where I serve as Executive Director. Uh, greetings, members of City Council and committee participants. I am delighted to join you today to speak on behalf of the wonderful partnership between the Greater Philadelphia Film Office and the School District of Philadelphia and to impress upon you the important impact of this work for our students, as well as the city's creative economy, present and future. The Greater Philadelphia Film Office with their Tripod Initiative is a premier partner for media arts programs in the School District of Philadelphia, providing students with exposure, access, and immersive experiences within the fields of film, television, and digital video. Through the Tripod Initiative, students learn about the variety of jobs and roles that comprise the film and television industries while engaging in hands-on training and experiences to develop their skills, as we say, from script to screen with everything in between. As we meet here today, students in Strawberry Mansion's Media Pathways program are participating in a multi-week workshop with veteran actor, writer, director, and Philadelphia native, Nakia Dillard. The sessions will likely start off with students excitedly yeah, asking Nikia tons of questions about his role in The Wire. Can someone go on mute? Excuse me, Mr. Sorry. Chair, can someone go on mute? Yeah. I don't know, Tom. There you go. All right. I think Tom the, Tom's right. unmuted. There you go. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Frank. No problem. The sessions today will likely start off with students excitedly asking Nakia tons of questions about his roles in The Wire and the new hit The Wonder Years, and lots of digging about what famous people he knows and what gossip and stories he can share. That will quickly give way to conversations about developing characters, framing and sequencing shots, and editing for continuity. In the end, the students will realize the stories they have to tell are just as important as the ones they were digging for earlier, and when they finish the program, they will have the skills and tools to share their stories with the world. This year, students are focusing on changing the narrative of Strawberry Mansion's high school and the community, highlighting the beauty and optimism of people and places they experience daily, counter to what they often hear and see portrayed by the media. For students with an interest in pursuing careers in the film and television industries, the Tripod program provides a unique opportunity for them to begin making critical connections to industry professionals while understanding the variety of roles and jobs it takes to bring a production to life. If you need more convincing, I invite you to simply read through the end credits of your favorite movie and try to figure out what each person does. I only recently myself learned the difference between a grip, gaffer, and best boy. Connecting Philadelphia students with these roles ensures that the city can remain competitive when recruiting prospective productions and also ensure that the crews facilitating these produ productions reflect the incredible diversity of this city. Beyond the film and media arts industry pipelines, these programs provide great benefits to all the students that participate. First, there's the understanding of how media is developed and distributed, which has never been more critical than in this time of social media and often less than accurate news. Second, we are living in a time when filming, creating content, and live broadcast are emergent across most professions. I offer the example of today's meeting and pose the question of who is streaming through an upgraded camera or with added lighting. Finally, this experience is fun, and for many students, that's a much needed catalyst for actively engaging and learning. I'll close my remarks with some data related to the economic impact of this work. The School District of Philadelphia contributes nearly $60 million per year to the creative economy of the city by way of over 450 certified arts educators' salary and benefits, and an additional $2 million in school-based arts budgets. Additionally, 13 different high schools offer career and technical education programs in digital media, film, and video production, and PSTV, our education channel, provides student access to multimedia tools, digital and media literacy training, and additional industry experience. For all of this work, we look forward to continuing to grow our partnership with the Greater Philadelphia Film Office, and with your support, we can ensure that the industry professionals continue to call Philadelphia home for years to come. Thank you for your time. Frank, thank you for your testimony. Um, Appreciate it. Are there any questions from any members? Councilmember Jones, did you have a question? Oh, you're muted, Councilmember Jones. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to what degree do you work with um, schools like Roxborough, which has a film and television office in Overbrook, which has a film and television office, and Barry in my district, to name a few? 
Sure, glad to respond to that. Uh, so our office supports all of our certified visual art, music, theater, dance, and media arts teachers. Um, and the programs that you're mentioning happen predominantly through our career and technical education programs, which is facilitated by a partner office. And um, some of the programs are through our media labs programs um, with PSTV, our TV station, and then also our outside partners like WHYY and their media labs and media hubs programs. So uh, part of the importance of the work that's happening right now with um, we, we are the program I mentioned at Strawberry Mansion is facilitated through outside funding through the Foreman Family Fund. And a large focus of that was creating some standardization to the different film programs that we offer. So all of the schools that you mentioned. Right now, because there's different offices and different program facilitators, there's a variance in what the students learn, what their experience is, how often they interact with the program. So one of the things that we saw funding and partnership with the film office to do is to standardize and align all of this learning and all these different programs to the industry standards. So having the premier organization that supports film in this city um, and access to all of the different industry professionals that they work with is allowing us to create a template that all of the programs that you inquired about are going to follow and make sure that no matter what students participate in, um, they, they come out with a, a basic understanding that leads to job opportunities. So in the years to come, we hope to scale this program and bring some of those industry professionals and visiting artists into programs in every single one of the schools. Are you familiar with the partnership between the MAN, a music center, Live Nation, uh, and Overbrook? Very familiar. I introduced all of those organizations for the purpose of developing that program at Overbrook. And the work that I'm speaking of today is our opportunity to expand that. So the program with the Man Center, Live Nation, Live Nation Urban, um, with an additional cast of partners, such as the Recording Academy and a number of music industry professionals, is really the blueprint. Uh, we've been working on that for about six to eight years in various capacities so that our teachers have support from the working industry professionals. Because as you know, most of the arts education programs are based in traditional models and methods. So our teachers come from traditional programs. When it comes to adding the technology and the industry experience, we really rely on those outside partners to bring that knowledge in. And having our students work directly with these industry professionals not only helps the teachers build their knowledge, but it gives the students an immediate network, right? That we, we heard about ecosystems earlier. So uh, we've, we've really been developing our music industry ecosystem and the work that's happening at Strawberry Mansion is designed to impact the entire film ecosystem and make sure that K-12 work is, is a part of the work going forward. I think it's important to create pipelines like that uh, from the theoretical education world to the practical, they produce concerts world at the man, as well as uh, worldwide um, institutions like Live Nation. You create a pathway to real jobs. And young people that are in schools like Barry and uh, Overbrook and Roxborough can see a pathway to a real job. So I encourage that kind of work and thank you for it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Jones. Is there any other questions for this panel? Hearing none, seeing none, uh, is there anyone else to testify on the resolution? Being none, thank you all for your testimony. Mr. Chair? Yes, Gag. I apologize. I'm trying to work with the chat feature. I just wanted to, to thank all of the panelists from panel three and panel four, uh, particularly Mr. Machos from the Office of Arts and Creative Learning at the school district, uh, recognizing the importance of career and technical education uh, as a pipeline for young people to get into careers in the arts and culture, and particularly in the film industry. Uh, here in the city of Philadelphia. So I just wanted to say thank you to each and every one of you for your testimony, for all your work, and our journey continues. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, uh, Council Member Gilmore. Um, apologize, I didn't see your hand was raised on the other feature. Um, all right, if there's no other uh, questions or anybody to testify on the resolution, uh, Mr. McMonagle, can you please uh, uh, hold on, um, sh uh, 
Sharon, did you want to make a comment before we end the conversation? I Thank you, thank you, um, Councilman. I um, I did want to make sure that that the members are aware that there are other people who provided um, written testimony, very important testimony um, that were they were not able to be here. Um, so, for example, um, um, Mike Barnes we from have, yeah, we have um, Sean has the list of. Uh, people who have provided written testimony for the record has been provided to the record. Sean, do you want to read the list of the names that have provided um, written testimony? M. M. Night Shyamalan submitted uh, written yeah. testimony. Tucker Tooley, who I had mentioned, is a producer on the Lee Daniels movie that is coming in. He has testified. There may be a couple of others that, that I've forgotten, I, but I thought those were some really important ones. Oh, um, Rob Busher as well from uh, the Asia, Philly Asian Film Festival also provided written testimony. Sean, do you want to provide a list of names of who they, they they are they are the only names that I have that that were just mentioned. Okay, thank you, and they will be added. Right. Right. Thank you so much, Sharon, uh, for your advocacy and continued work uh, to bring the film industry here to the city of Philadelphia and provide our economic input that's so important to the vibrancy of the city. So thank you again. Um, if there's no other questions or anybody else to testify on the resolution. We want to thank you all for your continued support. Oh, I see Tom. Uh, do you have a comment? Tom. I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to impart um, a sense of urgency right now. There is an unprecedented um, level of production that's going on both nation and, and worldwide right now. Um, six months last year, there was literally no production. So there was an absence of content that people are catching up, but there's all these streaming services are now online. So wherever there's a decent film tax credit, they're at now historical levels of production, but not Philadelphia. Philadelphia really has a, an opportunity now to really have a golden age of filmmaking if they do the right thing. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Tom, for that, and thank you for your continued advocacy. It's so important. Um, all right, well, thank you all for your testimony and conversation. And Mr. McMonagle, would you please reread the um, title of the bill and then the panels who will be testifying? Yes. Can we, uh, bill number 210632, amending chapter 17 1600 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Economic Opportunity Plans. By establishing new definitions and clarifying the manner in which credit is given for MWDSBE participation, all under certain terms and conditions. Thank you. Uh, if you want to read the first panel, and then we can start with their testimony, making sure they're all present. Can we please have Kiara Janae Avery? Yes, good morning. Good morning, Kiara. Just if you state your full name for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Sure, my name is Kiara Avery. Um, I am a client um, who work with Community Legal Services. Um, I work with Rachel Gallegos. Um, and I just want to mention that uh, just to start off that had it not been for Rachel and Community Legal Services, I probably would uh, still be dealing with the issues that I had trying to get everything situ situated and switched over um, with my property. Um, so just just to give you guys a little backstory, Rachel and Community Legal Services helped me out with um, modifying and transferring over um, my property, um, my loan and everything. And it was a very difficult um, situation and exhausting and caused much confusion, anger and resentment. Um, and unfortunately, nobody wants to mention that, you know, when you're grieving that you have to also deal with the unfortunate thing of a state and 
property and all of the other things that comes along with it. Um, and so that was my reality. And so I just wanted to mention that if had it not been for community legal services and Rachel and the work that they do there, that I would probably, if worst case scenario, could possibly even be homeless. And fortunately, that's not my situation at all. So, uh, yeah, that's just pretty much all that I have to share this morning. Um, thank you. Mr. Chair. Thank you for your testimony, Care. I saw them. Um, is there anyone else here to testify before we go to questions? John? There are a whole there are a number of panels, Mr. Chair. We want to read several names so they can get prepared and then we'll have them testify before we go into questions. Sure. Can we have our second panel come up? Uh, Commissioner Jim Leonard and Register Wills Tracy Gordon. All right, before they get started, Council Member uh, Richardson, um, did you want to uh, have a quick comment before? Um, yes, uh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to, to again thank our colleagues uh, for uh, being a part of this hearing on Bill number 210671, um, which will add a new chapter requiring certain businesses or professions to provide disclosures regarding tangled titles and deeds. This is an issue that is super important in the city of Philadelphia. I look at it as a home ownership and a home preservation issue in our city. Uh, based on the recent Pew report that uh, was released back in August, we know that more than 10,000 families are suffering with tangled titles and deeds across the city of Philadelphia. And what we want to do with this bill, Mr. Chair, is ensure that families receive the information at the time of their loved one's passing about how they can avoid being in a tangled title or deed. Uh, we know that about half of the cases are long term uh, tangled titles or deeds 10 years or more, but there are another half of cases that are less than 10 years. And we want to ensure that families receive as much information as possible at the time when their deceased loved one passes away and when they're handling uh, the business uh, of their loved one with the funeral home or, or funeral uh, home provider. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I hope that uh, we all listen to this testimony, understand the need uh, for the technical amendments that were made uh, with the help of our city's law department. And we are hopeful that all of our colleagues will support the passage of this measure uh, out of committee. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Again, thank you for your great work on this and it's a really important um, conversation to have. Looking forward to finding ways to resolve it. And it's not only resources, obviously, but it's a lot of work that's going to be involved. And I know Jim uh, is here to testify. So, Jim, if you want to uh, just state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Squilla and committee members. I am James Leonard, Commissioner of the Department of Records. Thank you for inviting me to testify on behalf of the administration in support of bill number 210671. I thank Council Member Gilmore Richardson for sponsoring this bill and for her determined and creative leadership on addressing the tangled title crisis. I also thank City Council for recently investing $7.6 million in new funding for tangled title as part of its neighborhood preservation initiative. Bill number 210671 would require the Department of Records to work with the Register of Wills to develop a tangled title information sheet that would be made available to funeral directors. Funeral directors would provide family members with this information sheet together with the deceased's death certificate. The administration supports this bill. Tangled title is a crisis confronting thousands of Philadelphia homeowners with a disparate impact on communities of color. It occurs most commonly when the legal owner dies and the surviving family continues to live in the property without legally transferring title to their name. Tangled title prevents one from exercising basic rights of home ownership. The complexity of the tangled title crisis requires a multifaceted approach, one facet of which is public outreach and education. 
For instance, register of wills Tracy Gordon's plan and prepare and protect series represents an unprecedented, an unprecedented effort to educate the public on the importance of estate planning. I applaud her efforts and have been honored to join her at a few of those events. The Department of Records also annually attends approximately two dozen community events sponsored by council members, state and federal elected officials, and nonprofit community partners to educate the public on how to transfer title to deceased family members' homes. About a week ago, we attended Councilman Jones, Jones's Community Resource Fair in the 4th District. Also, at the suggestion of the Council President's Office, the Register of Wills Office and I will be meeting with the Water and Revenue Departments next week to discuss putting a tangled title flyer in an upcoming water bill. Council Member Gilmore Richardson's bill represents yet another innovative effort to provide families with information on avoiding tangled titles. It recognizes that we need to meet our residents where they are. By partnering with funeral directors as a distribution point, we can leverage the likelihood that we can reach our communities in a meaningful and impactful way. Thank you again to, for the opportunity to testify in support of this bill. I'd be pleased to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Jim, so much for your testimony. And I, uh, Register Gordon, um, if you're available to testify, please state your name for the record and then proceed and then we'll go with questions after that. Register Gordon is still struggling with her phone, right? Yes, yes, yes. Good morning. Good morning. Thank can you. Can you hear me, Councilman Yes, we, we, we could hear you well. Uh, yeah, just state your name, uh, Register, um, and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. I just got finished hiking six miles, so excuse the, the, the hair. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to first start off to thank Councilman Kathy Gilmore Richardson about the introduction of this bill. Um, I remember a couple years ago when we both first started um, in this uh, with, with our new administrations, um, I talked to her uh, personally concerning her personal uh, struggle with uh, being able to tr transfer generational wealth without having wills and without proper planning of estates. And the first thing I said, that in order for us to solve this problem, we have to get the information out to people. And I remember I always said, because when I first started, I was getting a lot of phone calls from funeral homes. And you know they wanted to know how they could get the short certificate, how they could access funding, from um, the banks in order for them to even proceed with the funeral arrangements. And I said to myself, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could partner with the funeral homes and cemeteries and have some information there that they could give out to the families. And lo and behold, um, just under two years, um, this bill is being reintroduced um, by this committee here. And I'm really saying that I really, really do appreciate everything you're doing, um, Councilman Gilmore Richardson, as it regards to um, what we have here in the city of Philadelphia, and that's the pandemic of tangled titles. So good morning, my name is Tracy Gordon, Register of Wills for Philadelphia. I'm excited to testify at today's hearing. It's important we work in partnership with Philadelphia funeral homes to share information about the importance of proper estate planning beginning with making a will. Since day one of my administration, we have spread the message far and wide. Make a will. Dying without a will can have so many negative consequences, but I'll focus on the issues that I deal with at my office. And remember, our office is the register of wills, not the recorder of deeds. We help Philadelphians transfer their wealth after death but we don't have anything to do with transferring the deeds. I always take the time to point this out. This is a common misconception. Luckily, I'm able to work with Commissioner Lennon, and he's doing a wonderful job over there, but uh, he and I have put together some infomercials to go out to uh, the constituents uh, of the city of Philadelphia to let them know that we are two distinct offices. Earlier this week, I testified about the tangled title crisis. 
which is when a deceased person does not make a will and home ownership is not transferred correctly. This results in a tangled title and currently impacts over 10,000 homes, which we all know that means 10,000 families. I watch constituents without will struggle to get the necessary consent from their family members to administrate the estate because there was no will. If there's no family agreement as to who should be the administrator going forward, then a legal petition has to be filed. Then you are forced to stand in line with the other petitioners that are fighting to administer their estates. During this period of COVID, that line can be long. You may even need to have a hearing to settle the matter, which I preside over. My decision could then be appealed and then now you go to the orphan's court and stand in another line. Not having a will can be a time consuming and costly project that your grieving family will have to work out, which probably means fighting. I see it in my office all the time. As opposed to having a valid will and opening an estate, you are in and out of my office in less than an hour. We also recommend a self-proven affidavit so you won't have to worry about witnesses later. The best type of will that you get is one that is a self-proven affidavit that's bulletproof. People always ask me, can I write my will? Can I go to uh, online and make a will? Yes, you can, but it's not going to be, it probably won't be a bulletproof will. Somebody will be able to contest it. But if you go to an attorney and you make sure that's a self-proven affidavit, that's bulletproof. One of the most important things that are lost when there is no will is the opportunity to select the executor of your estate or to pick a guardian for your children. With a will, you have that you can you have that right, a constitutional right that in this will, my last will and testament, this is where my stuff is going. This is who I want to take care of my families in and out of my office. No tangled title. In our communities, the funeral director holds a place of esteem. This is the person that many people have those much needed conversations around death. When you attend a funeral for someone else, it's the perfect time to think about planning it for yourself. Catching people's attention at these critical moments is important. Once the funeral is over, we go back to our lives, and once again, estate planning is put on the back burner. It should be mandatory that literature be made available at funeral homes, reminding us of the importance of planning our own estates, beginning with drafting a will. I also want the literature to inform funeral directors and their customers how my office may be able to help them retrieve money from a deceased person's bank account if it contains less than $10,000. I'm for distributing this type of knowledge in as many areas as possible, especially during a point of purchase. Why wouldn't we, uh, as, as realtors, smart realtors, uh, uh, make that information available just like you make the information for them to get a homeowner's insurance policy, just like when you buy a car, auto insurance policy, just like when you have children or even for yourself, a, a proper estate plan and you make sure you have Life insurance. Don't we know to have that will? That's your insurance policy to protect and transfer your generational wealth. How that got lost here in the county of Philadelphia is tragic, but I have a solution at the Register of Wills. I'll be happy to have my office assist in the preparation of these materials, and we would just need some financial support to make it happen. Thank you all for being so uh, attentive uh, to this pandemic. Uh, we have identified where these homes are, which district they are. Now that we have all the statistics, we need funding so we can get the information out to your constituents so they can be able to make a solid choice on how they can uh, untangle $1 billion worth of uh, dead capital here in the city of Philadelphia. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you so much, Madam Register. Uh, Thank you so much, Madam Register. Uh
We also have a question from Councilmember Jones. Councilmember Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I had the opportunity to see a documentary called Many Rivers to Cross. It's on Channel 12. And it chronicled the first Africans and slaves to come to this continent. One of them wound up uh, at a plantation um, and was able to be so valuable that he earned his freedom, went on to acquire a farm with, um, I, I'm gonna guess, 250 acres that was very productive. He was able to do all of that in his lifetime. But because of the technicality, because he was not a citizen per se, um, he was not able to leave that property, that thriving plantation uh, where he had indentured servants and a slave, but he was not able to transfer that wealth to the next generation. So the county took it. Like it was then, like it is now, the importance of your office uh, is critical. It is how wealth is transferred from one generation to another. I want to thank you, your office, uh, and the members uh, at the record department for coming to our festival uh, right in the heart of um, West Philadelphia, where a lot of that tangled title issue is. Would you, for the record, cite some of the areas where this is a huge growing problem, particularly for people of color, Madam Register? Um, yes, and I, I don't know if, if um, um, my um, communication director, um, John Zimmerman, has access to put the map up, but there are primaries of West Philadelphia, Southwest Philadelphia, North Philadelphia, Lower Northeast, Germantown. Those are where the hottest areas are. And by the way, we need to stop saying, or at least put an asterisk besides how much our home in Philadelphia is worth. Because they'll say in those particular poor neighborhoods that there's say low housing value. And we absolutely know that location determines housing value. And nowhere near is Cobbs Creek Parkway, West Philly, uh, North Philly is uh, low income uh, or low quality housing when I see um, so much major development going on there. Getting these tank, uh, um, titles untangled will uh, get these homes and these constituents and these families, give them the ability to thrive in, in a home that was properly purchased by their mother or their grandmother. They just didn't know how to transfer it. And and and, and for, the, for the life of me, you know, a car depreciates, a home doesn't. So why wouldn't you know to make that insurance policy, put that point, that, make that will? They start anywhere from $100, simple wills. But depending on the complicated situations that we all live, previous marriages, different children by different marriages, and then even you may have some children recently, um, uh, uh, a close friend of mine, young daughter passed away with a two-year-old that has special needs. No will, you know, they, it was manageable because the surviving parent uh, was cooperative, but a lot of times families do not cooperate. It makes them fight. It makes them, um, uh, they, they, they pull uh, criminal records on each other, and it, it becomes very hostile. And, and and we just had one of the tangled titles. We untangled uh, the the young the family. They had the will, never knew to come and bring it down to us. Went to get uh, some basic system repairs and was rejected because uh, they found out that you couldn't qualify for the BSRP grant because the house is, is you don't own it. And they state literally that assets automatically transfer and it doesn't. There is a legal process that was already in place 400 years ago and somehow, some way, it slipped Philadelphia. And now we have the opportunity as uh, a registered wills uh, at city council, we already have all the data, all the stats. We already can make a change. I'm already partnering with um, 
the Department of Records, we 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 uh, we apply for uh, some um, grants. We're looking for grants, so we we're not just asking for money from the city of Philadelphia. We're just saying pass uh, uh, legislation like this and and give us some more funding so we can we can we can begin to penetrate this problem. Member Richardson, I want to thank you for bringing light to this uh, issue. Um, I also know that she, if I were to say this family name in Winfield, large landowners, property owners in Winfield, uh, headed by a mother who had um, maybe a half dozen children. When mother died, the siblings went into contest about who should control what properties. The properties fell into disrepair uh, for over a decade and um, wind up being utilized by government. But wouldn't that have been better if that family maintained control over those properties to send wealth into the next generation and beyond? So I won't say the name, but Member Richardson, by her nod of agreement, knows who I'm talking about. How wonderful would it have been for them to have their affairs in a will that, you know, people could then um, follow the cues of the patron mother um, to um, follow. So thank you for what you're doing, Madam Register. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Is there any other questions for this panel? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I had a quick comment I, I had in the chat, but I just wanted to to thank our records commissioner, Commissioner Leonard, and Madam Register Wills Tracy Gordon for all of your work uh, on this issue. Uh, you all have done so much, and we are simply trying to work with you as partners in government uh, to do all that we can uh, to avoid families getting involved with tangled titles and deeds. And I want to applaud you for the probate deferment initiative and. Commissioner Leonard for waiving fees and uh, Register Wills Gordon for waiving fees for families. And as you stated, as both of you stated, it's the education that is so important. It's the information that's so important. And Madam Register, I have to say this on the record uh, for this hearing, that it was information that I heard on one of your educational programs um, that I actually participated in as a panelist. Uh, that made me know and understand that this issue could too be resolved for for my family and I. So I just wanted to thank you for all the education, for your innovative communication strategies and social media techniques, uh, particularly around uh, the Register React series. And you all have gotten a lot of feedback uh, both uh, locally, but also uh, internationally, uh, hearing back from the producers of uh, Queen Sugar, uh, about yes. that show that is centered uh, around a family who's in distress as a result of the father passing away, uh, not having a, a will and, and needing to figure out what they're doing with their family's property. So I just wanted to thank you so much for your work. I don't have any questions, but I'm looking forward to the remainder of this hearing. Uh, I'm hello. Greg. Yes. Jeff. Hi, my name is Gregory Burrell. I am president of Terry Funeral Home, and I also would like to uh, uh, hold on. All right, hold on one second. Hold on, Mr. Terry. Okay. Um, if there's no other questions for the panel, we will then introduce um, Gregory, who'd like to testify. Just state your full name again, Greg, and then I am. Uh, my, name is, my name is Gregory Burrell. I am president at Terry Funeral Home in West Philadelphia. Uh, and I would just like to uh, echo uh, the sentiments of most of you who've spoken this morning. This is a huge issue for us. And uh, I, you know, I heard the commissioner say it, at the end of the day, it's all about education. Uh, I think what we see from our standpoint is that families don't think about this issue until they're put in this this position where they got a death, you know, they can't go to the register of wills until the funeral is over and people just don't know. But I promise you that if we can get this information out to people, it may not 
resolve or solve this problem, but it will definitely help. And I was just thinking, I think as funeral directors, one of the things that we can do is also disseminate this information to churches. So when, I, I mean, I know that some churches at my own church during prayer meeting, they talk about uh, issues like this. And, you know, we do seminars at some churches to help people prearrange their funerals. And, and, uh, but, but I, I, I will admit that from a funeral director's standpoint, we have been negligent in our responsibilities, responsibilities in terms of educating the consumer on these type issues because we, we run into it all the time. And I have a question for the uh, uh, Ms. Gordon. Uh, one of the things that we keep hearing about uh, people being able to handle their business is that they cannot do it until the funeral is over. And I was trying to see if, if one, if that's accurate. Number two, is there something that th that can be done about that? And the reason is, is because a lot of families who come or to, to arrange funerals, they live out of state and they try to take care of most of the business that they have to take care of prior to them leaving. And so, but I've always explained to them that they cannot do any of this until the funeral is over. So is there is there something that, is that number one, accurate? Number two, is there something that can be done about that? I think my solicitor, Sharon Wilson, are you on? Did she yes, I on? am. Okay, you can take that one. This is my solicitor, Sharon Wilson, attorney Sharon Wilson. She'll answer. Yeah, Sharon, say your, say your name again for the record, Sharon, and then proceed. Your my name is Sharon Wilson, solicitor for the Register of Wills. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. And to your, and to your question, Mr. Burrell, first of all, I want to say one of the things that we can do is we can hold some of those seminars together where you are talking to churches about what could be done. But sure. as far as helping, as far as coming to the register of wills, it's not the funeral that is the most predominant um, characteristic that we're looking for, it's the death certificate. Yeah. So if, if as a funeral director, you are able to issue the death certificate prior to the funeral, then people don't have to wait for a funeral uh, in order for us to take the steps that we need to move forward. We have to prove that there's been a valid death, uh, not a oh, valid death. Oh, that is, that, so that is, yeah, cause uh, you know, we, we've, we've heard families have come back to us and said, well, we can't do anything until the funeral is over. And, but, but the reason they're saying that is because they don't have the death certificate. In exactly. Hand. I got you, I got you. Cause it's really important and uh, I, you know, I've been sharing that information, and it just did not sound accurate. But I do understand what you're saying. So, and that's one of the things. And we try to explain to families: there is absolutely nothing you can do without that death certificate. Nothing you can do. So we try on our end to get these death certificates back as soon as possible, so families can go down and uh, take care of their business. But I will tell you. I've listened to everybody this morning. Education, education, education is the key to this. And 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 I'll also say, say this to you, Mr. Burrell, that we will come um, and, and train all the funerals to every part of my organization. And we will explain to you all what a short certificate is, yeah. um, uh, what what it means to probate. The fact yeah. that um, if they go to the bank account and it's ten thousand dollars or less, and they can provide a death certificate, a funeral bill, and proof of uh, a relation, then the bank has to release those funding. Some banks don't know that it's ten thousand dollars or under. If it's $10,000 or more, the bank will turn you away and, and redirect you to our office for the short certificate. But my office will come. I train city council, the state. We will do this via virtually team meeting at your time. Yeah. And I will bring my entire staff and we will teach you everything it is to know about the register of wills, 
and the re recorder of records, uh, uh, Commissioner Jim Leonard, he's part of that training as well. Well, well, I think that is important because you're absolutely right. You know, you can go to five different banks and each one has a different rule mm -hmm. about how this is supposed to go. <laughs> I served on the Pennsylvania State Board for 10 years and I tried to explain to people all you need if the if it's ten thousand dollars or less, you can go with a death certificate and a funeral bill and take care of your business. I, and I'm not calling any names of banks, but there are some banks that are worse than others in terms of releasing these funds. So one, again, education, education, whether it's a consumer or these banking institutions, because this is extremely stressful for families. I mean, and, you, you and know, also you, we, we will give your you and all the directors uh, of these funeral homes direct access to my office. So yeah. you won't have to be on hold and. Yeah, Our office yeah. is open. Um, um, we um, we never close down during the pandemic. Um, we have a direct phone line. We have a direct email yeah. line. And yeah. it's fine. Well, you, you know what I'm thinking is now that we're talking about this, that we have to figure out a way to get this information out earlier. And, and I think going through churches where there are masses of people are is, is probably the way. Because look, the reality of it is once the person is dead, it's too late. I mean, they need to know this information in advance because yeah. I mean, they're scrambling at that point. So you got to you got to deal with the fact that you got this death and everybody is grieving. And then you're trying to figure out all this business stuff that you have no idea where to start. And when, so I, when you could have just gotten yourself a will. Let somebody know where the will is because I get a lot of families that come to our office and they can't even find a will. So that's no will. Put yeah. it in a safe uh, place. Yeah. Let somebody yeah. know where the will is. And yeah. then your family, after they do all arrangements, they just have to pick up the envelope with the will and yeah. take it, go down to room 180, City Hall, sit there for an hour. And you don't even have to have an attorney in and out with the transfer. We'll send you off to the recorder deeds, Jim Leonard, and then you go take care of all the bank accounts, stocks and bonds, or even any guardianship uh, uh, things that you have to deal with, as opposed to no will, the fighting, the oh. miscommunication, the misinformation, oh. and now 10,000 tangled titles, $1 billion worth of dead capital sitting in Philadelphia. Well, and, and, and I hear you, but it's easier said than done because we try to get families to prearrange their funerals so they don't come in here at the last minute thinking funerals are $2,500 because they don't know, because they have not been educated on the cost of funerals, what goes into a funeral and that sort of thing. So again, we got to figure out how to get this message out prior to the death because it is way too stressful i mean if it comes at that time fine but the more we can do up front the better off everybody is going to be so i we're all in and uh, i'm not sure if miss buford is on this call but i will pass this information on to yes i'm on i'm on the call actually i okay, was going to go before you but i excuse you <laughs> okay i will uh i will pass this information on to the uh president of the uh the this this association so we can sort of get the ball rolling and figure out what is the best way to get this information out other than us just having it here at the funeral home at when a person passes away thank you and if there's no other questions for me my office will still be on hold sharon will be able to answer your questions i have another meeting but Councilman Swiller, did any of the other council people have any questions for me? I do not think so. I don't see any in the chat. Uh, let me just check real quick. OK, I do not see any there. So thank you, uh, Madam Register, for uh, your testimony and support of this. It's uh, really important. Um, we'll, we will continue with uh, more testimony. Yes. Hi, Can my we, name is Irina. Yeah, Irina, yes, you, you are. I'm sorry. Uh, I know uh, we jumped ahead of you. Uh, everybody gets excited to testify on something they really want to see happen. So we appreciate you being here. Just state your name again for the record and proceed with your testimony. My name is Irvina White Buford. And uh, I guess it's almost good morning to you all. 
I'm the owner of Irvina White Buford Funeral Service located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, with a branch office also in Pottstown. I'm licensed funeral director in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and New Jersey and a social worker by degree. I have served as past president of Quaker State Funeral Directors Association, past board member of the National Funeral Directors and Morticians Association, past president of Epsilon Nu Delta Mortuary Fraternity, and chairperson of NAUW. As a current member, I'm a member of the National Funeral Directors Association and the Pennsylvania Funeral Directors Association. Our previous was the host of two very popular informational radio broadcasts, In Perspective, which was heard on Word 900, and Words of Inspiration, which was heard on WNAP Gospel Highway 11. Over the past nine years, my weekly broadcasts discuss topics of death, dying, and planning ahead to hundreds of faithful listeners. Over the past 17 years, I've had the opportunity to meet with hundreds of families making funeral arrangements. One of my personal practices has always been to do a property search on the Philadelphia BRT website before the arrangement conference appointment to verify an address given to me for a decedent. This 